Welcome into EP Wealth Investors Informed Investor Market Update. Joining me today with CFP and CFA Adam Phillips, Director of Portfolio Strategy with EP Wealth. Let's do a quick year to date update. The NASDAQ's down 31% year to date. The SP 500 down 19%. The, S the Dow Jones Industrial Average considered the value of the three markets that we're talking about down 9%. 10 year Treasuries closing out the year around 3.5%, an area. That, that at the beginning of the year, we never would have thought three and a half percent was where we're going to get to, but it feels right right now. Of note, Tesla down 57% this year, very similar to Bitcoin's uh, down year, which is interesting to me. December has not started with a Santa Claus rally. There's nothing ho, ho, ho or jingle bells going on. Adam, let's talk a little bit about what we've seen in the first couple of weeks of December, because I think the market was looking for something a little different. Yeah, I think so. I mean, so far we've gotten a lump of coal, right? The S&P 500 down about 6% or so, uh, so far in December. Um, and you know, I, I think we need to maybe just uh, go a little bit uh, further back in the calendar and, and just acknowledge we've, we had a nice little rally there before. That's true. I think what we have seen uh, in recent weeks is, is really, um, you know, maybe we got to a point where we were short term overbought uh, from the market standpoint. Okay. And now we are, I, I think investors are now grappling with, uh, with, with the Fed and, and the fact that uh, they're likely to continue um, with this tight policy for longer than maybe than they expected. I, you know, I, I think we have been talking about Rob in, in recent weeks, how maybe the Fed was, uh, or excuse me, maybe investors were a little bit, um, they were investing um, uh, out of hope, right? And, and maybe um, uh, not using their listening ears, as, as, I, as I say to my kids. Uh, and, and they were really just hopeful that the Fed would, would ease, uh, ease up on this policy tightening a little bit sooner than expected. But, um, but it, in, I think last week's events really tell us that uh, inflation has a long way to go here, even though we're seeing some positive signs in, in the latest inflationary data, the Fed's job is not done yet. And so I think this pullback that we've seen is really a response by investors saying, okay, uh, we're, we're going to see this restrictive policy for a little longer than we had hoped. Speaking of hope, I do a popular podcast. And one of the phrases that I get to say way too often is hope belongs in churches. I hope there's an afterlife and hope belongs on the football field. I hope the 49ers make the playoffs or the Super Bowl. Um, but it doesn't really belong on Wall Street. And the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is telling us, let's not hope, let's let's go with the data. Um, let's talk a little about what Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said last week. And that mixed with a big data week of the CPI. In hindsight, what did we learn? Well, it was really interesting. You know, on on uh, Tuesday of last week, we got the November inflation data in, in the form of the CPI, and those numbers actually came in better than expected. We saw that inflation continues to soften up and moderate here. We obviously have a long way to go on a year-over-year -year basis. If you look at headline inflation, uh, really just including all those price categories, we're still up just over 7% year-over-year. So that's a far cry from that, what we what we refer to as that healthy rate of inflation called 2% or so. But we are seeing on a month over month basis, these numbers are trending lower, right? We're seeing uh, one or two tenths of a percent month over month. And that's a lot better than what we, we've seen in recent months. And so I think the trend is certainly positive. And after that report on Tuesday, I, I think some investors were hoping that uh, this would lead the Fed to uh, maybe take a more what we call a dovish approach towards uh, future policy actions, uh, implying that okay, their their actions to date have um, have been, I guess, successful or, or productive in in reducing these inflationary pressures. Maybe they can ease up a little bit going forward. And uh, many, I, I think, were surprised uh, on when on Wednesday the FOMC meeting concluded. And they announced a 50 basis point rate hike, which I think most were really expecting. But I, what what not everyone was expecting were the um, in the summary of economic projections and the dot plots that they released, as well as in uh, Chairman Powell's press conference, which really said uh, implied that they have a long way to go here. Um, their um, inflationary pressures are still a long way from being what they consider normal, and so they said even though. We we did raise rates by just you know just with air quotes here fifty basis points after four consecutive seventy five basis point rate increases. 
uh, they they are uh, likely to to keep raising rates at future meetings, and even once they're done raising rates, they're likely to keep. Uh, policy rates elevated until they see additional signs that uh, inflation is easing and moving closer towards that 2% target. And so that, that is what we would refer to as a hawkish message that uh, I, I think investors were, some were caught off guard, especially, uh, and, and I think you can see that in the fact that markets had rallied uh, in uh, in the days and weeks leading up to uh, this policy meeting. And so I think that's why you're seeing some of that being given up right now. Um, when, uh, you know, I, we, we always hear, um, you know, there, there's this popular aphorism, don't fight the Fed. Well, investors were caught off guard there. And, and I, I think if we're looking at the data today, I think that many investors are still fighting the Fed. They are telling us pretty clearly their job is not done yet. I mentioned the dot plots, um, which is, um, it, it's something that they produce every uh, and publish every every three months. So we got the updated dot plots, and it really just says where these 19 FOMC participants expect the Fed funds rate, so policy rates, to end uh, the year uh, in uh, say at the end of 22, at the end of next year, at the end of 2024, and then longer term. And so if we look at those dot plots, it tells us that just about every FOMC participant expects uh, rates to move higher from here, uh, continue rising into uh, next year, and then remain elevated for some time. But if you look at what the bond market, say, is pricing in, it, it's uh, it's really going against those uh, FOMC participants and, and saying that they are either trying to call the Fed's bluff or maybe are uh, are more hopeful that the that inflation will moderate before then so the Fed won't have to raise rates or keep policy tight as long. And so there's really this misalignment. And I think when you see this, it's it's the risk setting investors up for disappointment. And I think that's what, what I really take away from the last several days here is that there's still this misalignment. I think the Fed is trying to be very, very clear here with the challenges that remain. Uh, and investors, uh, I, I used the, the phrase before, um, you know, not using their listening ears. I, I think a, a lot of them are, are still uh, maybe in denial. And so I think that's why we're seeing this volatility here. When you look up the word professional in an encyclopedia, there's a picture of Adam Phillips. I'm throwing a curveball at you. 2021 was a year where you and I were incredulous. It was like 70 new highs. On a regular basis, we were doing these updates. 2022, I think, has been the year of the I word, inflation, where we've talked about it. I kind of wish it wasn't all year, but it's been all year. And I think 2023 is turning into a situation where we're going to be talking about the R word, the recession. Is it, you're just talking about recent data. Let's pull back out and look at the year. Is, am I getting those themes about right? I think you are. And, and that's, I'm really happy that you mentioned that, Rob. I, obviously, last year was great. We tried to set expectations uh, uh, among investors as well as our own expectations and saying, look, this is really fun when the market's hitting new all-time high after new all-time high, but it's not normal. And so we've seen a little bit of a return to normal, and it's been a little, it's kind of a painful adjustment when that happens. But I think a lot of what's driven uh, this year's performance has been inflation and the Fed's uh, policy response, right? Next year, and, and even right now, we're starting to see a little bit of a change here with the theme where the concerns are less about inflation because we are seeing inflation moderate, um, but more about uh, recession and, and the risk that um, all of this, uh, this aggressive policy response um, will have on the economy. We know that the policy acts with a lag, and so a lot of these recent uh, moves and in, in interest rates haven't aren't yet reflected in a lot of the data. And so that's going to take some time. And so I think that's why we're seeing it, whether you look at the bond market or the stock market, uh, a lot of the concerns now are pointing towards, okay, well, what does this mean for growth going forward? And so I think we're seeing a similar message from both the stocks and the bonds uh, in, in which it's saying growth is likely to moderate and we are risking a recession here. If we look at the data, the economic data, I'd say a lot of it is still positive. We've seen a lot of resilience here, particularly in the jobs market, right? Where um, we're still seeing unemployment rate is still extremely low. New jobs uh, being added every month, still very, very high, even though they're trending down. Um, but uh, but we are seeing some signs of, of weakness here. And, and for a while now, we've talked about the strength of the consumer and, and pointed to that as really what's been helping us live um, uh, I, I guess, get by in the face of higher inflation. And we're now starting to see some early cracks forming in the consumer. We got the, the signs of that last week in the retail sales data at the end of last week. 
which showed uh, sales uh, month over month actually fell about uh, six tenths of a percent. So that was the weakest uh, in almost a year. Now this is good spending, so it doesn't account for service spending. And, and so this uh, this week we'll actually get uh, the, I, I'd say more broader data around the consumer. Um, but I think that's something that we're really watching for um, to help inform our outlook of the economy since the consumer is such a big part of it. Um, so this week we're getting personal income, personal spending data. This will also tell us what the latest savings rate is. And so the last time we got the savings rate in the U.S., it actually uh, fell to 2.3%, which is very, very low. Um, lo this is the second lowest on record. Back in 1995, we saw the savings rate was 2.1%. So it tells us that that consumers are eating into their uh, eating into their savings, using most of their income for their day-to-day -day spending needs. And obviously, that's that's not too surprising when you look at what inflation is doing right now. And so we were fortunate as, as consumers, households were fortunate to come into the year with a, a pretty healthy savings cushion. Accumulated savings were up around $2.4 trillion if you look at the amount of savings compared to pre-pandemic levels. So they had a lot of excess cash to be able to spend in the face of higher inflation. We're now seeing those numbers come down quite, uh, um, quite rapidly. And that tells us that Elevated savings levels can only get you so far. Eventually, it's uh, it, it's it, it's going to have an impact on the data, and so I would expect we're going to start seeing that now. And that really, uh, I think, speaks to the fear that we have about a slowdown uh, in in the upcoming months. Yeah, and I want to add a little color and see if we could get a good reply out of you. I saw that retail sales lost forty thousand jobs in November, which is unheard of for the holiday season upon us. So. You and I are dealing with inflations as we shop, but the corporations are dealing with wage inflation, and it looks like they're cutting employees and saying, we need you to do a little bit more with a little bit less, and we need to see if we can get through this together. Um, but the inflation's hurting corporations as well with wages. Um, I was shocked to see retail sales positions down as dramatically as they were in November, and that tells me, again, it, it's a lot of moving pieces and I really envy you and I, I, I feel bad for you all at the same time because you have to juggle these and, and, and communicate them to me and to the audience out there. Well, look, just like you feel bad for me, I feel bad for the Fed because they're the ones that actually have to manage policy in this environment. And it's really challenging, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, honestly, the easy job is for me to sit here and interpret the data and, and try to tell you where I think it's going, but I'm not the one that has to decide on, on what to do with policy rates and because that really does have a big impact. Now, it, just to your point real quick, I think that, that you hit on something really interesting there. Even though we're seeing inflationary pressures, broad inflationary pressures moderate right now, the Fed is very quick to point out that what we're where we're not seeing inflation moderate is on the wages side. Yeah. Right? Average hourly earnings still up just over 5% year over year. And so that tells you that these companies are likely uh, to, to be challenged. Um, what we're seeing uh, profit margins, expectations for profit margins come in. Um, you know, uh, our, our own uh, profit profit um outlook is uh, is for is for core earnings to to continue to come down into 2023 and so these are very real challenges and i think it says a lot when companies specifically in the retail space are having to resort to layoffs when we know that for so long they have been desperately trying to hire um and right and you know there, there's yeah. over 10 million job openings in the US and so obviously there's a lot of demand for these workers but it, it tells you that companies are really struggling when they actually have to say, you know what, we we need people, but it's actually we're better off getting rid of headcount right now because of the impact from uh, rising wage pressures. Let me end with a housing question. But before I do that, let me say this is EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. I'm speaking with CFP, CFA, Adam Phillips, Director of Portfolio Strategy. Now is a great time to reach out with your wealth team. It's the end of the year. It's a, a calendar event that everyone should like check in on their finances and check in with their financial team this time of year. Very, very important because there's a lot of stuff you can still do constructively. But let's talk about housing and what you're seeing, um, I saw home builder sentiment this morning wasn't great. They're giving a lot of incentives. Again, as a consumer of real estate, I'm happy they're giving incentives. But as a capitalist pig, you know, who's looking at earnings, I'm like, anytime you discount, that's, that's coming out of earnings. And that's not a good thing because it's not demand driven. It's like um, managing expectations. 
what are you seeing out of the housing market right now that that you like or don't like? <laughs> Not a whole lot that that I like okay. uh, in, in the housing market, right? I, I, I'd say that we aren't too surprised either. Uh, the, you know, housing is the most rate sensitive area of the economy. And so it's not too surprising we're seeing some weakness there, especially after a 40% price growth in, yeah. in the last two years. And so you should expect some moderation here. That just was not sustainable. And it was because supply and demand was so out of balance. And so we need some kind of uh, balance to be restored here. I think that's what we're seeing. And sometimes that process can be painful. This is not another housing crisis um, you know, that's about to be repeated. I think the two are very, very different. But what we saw in the latest data today from home builders was that um, for the 12th consecutive month, confidence among home builders declined. Investors and, and economists were actually expecting a slight increase in the number. Um, and so that was a big surprise. The increase was expected to come from the, uh, the the recent easing in mortgage rates, even though they're still high, they've come off a little bit from, from hitting around 7% or so on 30-year average fixed rate mortgage. But I think it tells you that housing is likely to be challenged in, in the coming months uh, as a result of this environment. Uh, what what I would, and, and this week we haven't gotten it yet, but we're expecting um, this existing and new home sales data to show continued weakening here. And I think this is just part of that re readjustment period that can sometimes be a little bit painful, but again, not too surprising. I, I think some kind of, uh, even though it's not uh, too pleasant when it happens, I think it is healthy to get these things restored. And so I think the question into 2023 is going to be how far do home prices have to fall to get back into balance. We know that there are still supply issues. There's still not a, a lot of supply available for potential buyers. And so how, but the question is how far do prices need to come down to get those buyers back, uh, back into the market to get them to participate? Because we know that affordability is still a huge issue when rates are as high as they are. And when you zoom in on this topic, you can see that mortgage, new mortgage payments are roughly double what they were three years ago. And yet when you zoom out, I bought a house in my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, my 50s, and it always works out over a 10-year period. But in the moment, I'm a little freaked out with that higher mortgage payment, zoom in versus zoom out. I, 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 I hope people have the big picture because like you said, the last two years have been wonderful. But I, did you see the study last week that came out? I think it was um, maybe Citibank said something like, if you bought a home in 2021, you're not wealthy. If you bought a home in 2020, you're wealthy. And it's like, that's the dividing line. That's our Mason Dixon of the housing market. Right. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, look, I, I think that that just feeds into this, this um, short-term perspective. And I think it's so important to just take a step back and acknowledge the fact that, you know, it's 6% mortgage, even though it feels pretty high compared to where we've been in recent years, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually not that unreasonable considering how high rates have been in the past. And so, yeah, we, we know that um, many can, can in, in the future, you can always refinance. Uh, but I think it does, because people are, are kind of looking at where rates were, they, they feel like they missed the opportunity. It's so important, though, Number one, not to buy more house than than you can afford, right. and I think that really speaks to why we do financial planning for our clients, but also uh, to really take a longer term view here, um, because mortgage rates today isn't necessarily what you're going to be stuck with, right? A lot of people do refinance, and I, I think the reason, one of the reasons that we do feel more optimistic about the housing market, and I mentioned we don't expect a repeat of the of the housing crisis here, is because the majority of homeowners, whether you bought it. In, uh, you bought in 21 or 20 or, or what have you, the majority have rates that are that are well below, say, three and a half percent on their mortgages. And so I think that really just speaks to that supply issue. A lot of people kind of feel these in a way of golden handcuffs. They're kind of stuck. They feel stuck with the homes they have. And so maybe that means fewer homes on the market because those potential sellers are looking at that and saying, well, I don't necessarily want to give this up because this rate's pretty darn good. And if I went into something, even if I upsized, I'd have a higher rate. And so I think that really just kind of perpetuates this issue and uh, this issue and why uh, we are we expect this supply and demand to come further into balance, but it's going to take some time. Always buy what you can afford and never bite off more than you can chew. And yet still 20, 30 years after the fact, I wish I would have bought more house in my 20s, but 
I guess I avoided bankruptcy by making a mistake here or there. So thanks very much. It's Adam Phillips, CFP, CFA, Director of Portfolio Strategy with EP Wealth. Great time to reach out to your wealth team right here, right now to end the year. I'm Rob Black for the Informed Investor Market Update. Good day. 